Our text today is from Philippians chapter 2. I'll begin reading with verse 5 and read through verse 11. While you're turning to that passage, I want to make a few introductory remarks about Philippians. Paul's inspired letters can be easily divided into four groups. First and second Thessalonians around AD 51, 52. Then his great doctrinal letters, 57 or 58, that would be 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Romans. Then his four prison letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, around AD 61, 62, and then 67, 68, his pastoral letters of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. The Apostle Paul came to Philippi on his second missionary journey. The signature event that happened there, as you remember, was the earthquake and the conversion of the Philippian jailer. He left and went through Amphipolis and Apollonia to Thessalonica. He was there only three Sabbath days, and yet the Philippian church sent once and again unto his necessity. They were a generous church and had a special bond or relationship with him, but for many years they did not have an opportunity to give him anything because they didn't know where he was. When they found out that he was in Rome, they sent one of their men, Epaphroditus, and as a bit of trivia, verse 25 of chapter 2, he's called a messenger. That's the apostle of the church. There are three levels of apostles. Jesus, level number one, the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Level number two, the 12 sent directly by Jesus. Level number three, Epaphroditus, Barnabas, and others who were apostles of the church. Well, uh, now Epaphroditus comes and apparently he tells Paul about a little bit of problems in the church. Iodius and Syntyche, for example, were not getting along with one another. And so in the first verses of chapter 2, he gives them five reasons to have unity amongst themselves. They are being united with Christ, number one. Number two, the power of his love, number three, the fellowship of his spirit, number four, the tenderness and compassion that you get from Christ, number five, if for no other reason than to make me happy. <laughs> Fulfill my joy that you be like mine. Get along. Quit this fussing. And then I like the King James Version, let this mind be in you. Or you your attitude should be the same attitude as that of Christ. Now we're going to read that Jesus took seven steps down. He deliberately did this. He was God, equal with God, but he didn't count that something to be clutched at. Sociologists refer to the inverse relationship between love and power. The more you love, the less power you have. Like your son dating a very popular girl in high school. He's madly in love with her, but she's got a dozen boyfriends. And so he loves her more than she loves him. That gives her the power. She can treat him any way she wants to because he loves her more than she loves him. Well, as you know, Jesus was despised and rejected of men. (laughs) Yet he loved us. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let's read. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now here are seven steps now. Number one, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. That's number two. He made himself nothing, one, took the nature of a servant, two, three, made in human likeness, four, He was found in appearance as a man. Five, he humbled himself. Six, he became obedient to death. Number seven, even death on the cross. Now you remember, Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. So now he's going to be tapping into a new power source. This is what he did. He made himself of no, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. He he became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. That's what Jesus did. Now, (laughs) God's taken over. We're tapping into a new source of energy and power, a power that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
And this was something, I remember Brother Wilson always said, study the prayers of the apostles. They prayed differently than modern preachers pray. So in Ephesians 1, Paul says, I want you to know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And saints, and I want you to know the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion every name that is named now that's what we're going to read about now what God did therefore God exalted him to the highest place too Gave him a name that above every name. Three, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Four, in heaven and earth, uh, five, in heaven four, earth five, six, under the earth, uh, seven, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Seven steps down, seven steps up by God. And I want to give you seven principles that will perhaps help you to appropriate this power, which is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. Yeah. Principle number one, guidance of God. Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And every aspect of his life and ministry was predicted by the prophets and read in the synagogue centuries before it came to pass. He didn't just live and he didn't just die and he wasn't just raised again. He lived according to the scriptures. He died and was raised again according to the scriptures. So he was on a path being guided by, he said, I always do those things that are pleasing unto him. And whatever God wanted him to do, Jesus did it. And remember in Gethsemane, not my will. It doesn't matter what I want, God. It's your will. The Apostle Paul was guided. Just as the shepherd guides the sheep, just as the head directs the body, Saul of Tarsus said, go into Damascus. You'll find out what to do. There's a guy over there, I'm giving him a vision. He's going to come and lay hands on you and heal you of your blindness. And he did it. And I said, rise and be baptized. Said, yes, sir. <laughs> Wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. And throughout all of his ministry, he was being guided. We're talking about you and me too, because I want us to be guided by God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Amen. On the second evangelistic tour, he wanted to go to Asia. Holy Spirit said, nope. Want to go over with any? Holy Spirit said, nope. Gets to Troas, there's a man of Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. He said, all right, I'll do it. They, they you know, you got to test the spirits. They didn't just blindly follow a vision. They assessed and analyzed this thing. Yes, this is of God. He gets over to Philippi and thank God he knew it was from the Lord because he had been beaten unjustly, put in prison unjustly, and he was down there singing. <laughs> he knew something good going to happen because God led me here. And God now I'm going to put me in a place where he can't take care of me. That's the nature of our God. Now, with reference to you and to me, uh, I just have this growing conviction that just as the head controls the members of the body, just as the shepherds and not my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. They will do it. If they're, if they're my sheep, if you enlist in his army and the captain of our salvation says do something, we do it. We don't question. We want to be guided by God. Now, I want to venture into a little different level. I'm not certain that God has a plan for your life, but I want you to at least ponder that possibility. David said, all of my days were ordained before one of them came to be. Amen. Jeremiah 1, 5, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet from his mother's womb. Isaiah 49, 5, Isaiah was called to be a servant of the Lord from his mother's womb. Isaiah 44, Cyrus was destined to be a king who would rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't even destroyed at that time. But there was going to be this baby named Cyrus. It's a fascinating story. Sometime read Herodotus, the Greek historian, about how Cyrus was directed by God and how God opened before him the two leave gates. He's the only Gentile who is called the Lord's anointed, Isaiah 45, 1. I think Peter had a plan, you know, 
uh, God had a plan for Peter's life. He said, I, I know you, Simon, but I'm giving you a new name. You're going to have a personality change and your vacillating character is going to be replaced by the steadfastness of a rock. I'm calling you Peter. And then by the sea, when Peter was fussing about, what about him? He said, what John does, none of your business. If I will that he tarry till I come, that's none of your business. When you were young, you got your clothes on, did what you wanted to do. And when you get old, somebody else is going to put something clothes on you and take you where you don't want to go. And this he spake, signifying by what manner of death Peter would glorify God. That was set in stone. God had planned in advance how Peter was going to die. Herod was not going to behead him. James could be beheaded, not Peter. God had a different plan for Peter's life than he did for James. God has a different plan for your life than he does for mine. But it just adds a new depth of insight to just think, wow, just maybe, just maybe God has a call on my life. You look at the stars like Abraham did. He had seen them for 86 years, same stars. But on one night, oh, 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 it was different. Amen. It was different on that one night. And Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Amen. You may be 86 years old, but on this day, just maybe, you're going to see those stars in a little different light and you're going to say, God, I see it. I understand what you're doing. And before I forget it, I am not, I admire Brother Given. He's so organized. Have you got next year's renewal already planned? See, I don't, you know, I, I just, I, I, uh, I admire people who plan like that. But I was reading about the burial of Jesus and I thought, man, this is something. Here's the most important burial in the history of the world and nobody was in charge. Peter and Andrew, they were gone someplace and we had kind of an ad hoc committee <laughs> of uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and a couple of women and everything. You say, man, this is not very Good to have the most important death and burial in the world and nobody's in charge, nobody's planned it. And then I read Isaiah 53. <laughs> Over 700 years before, God had the whole thing planned out. He's going to be buried with the rich. I'm going to see to that. So here's old Joseph. He said, you know, man, I got an idea. <laughs> I got this brand new tomb over here in it. Nobody's ever been put in there before. I'm going to volunteer to put Jesus in that tomb. And he thought it was his idea. <laughs> and so you may have an idea. And you thought, I thought of this. But just maybe. You know, he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. And it's kind of hard sometimes to decide what you decided and what God decided to do through you. Principle number two, first is the guidance of God. Number two, obedience to the commands of Christ. To obey is better than to sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. Jesus said, I always do what the Father wants me to do. He learned obedience by, even though he was a son, even though he, was, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, he was obedient to God. The apostle Paul said to the king, O king, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Amen. Whatever God called Paul to do, yes, sir, I'm going to do it. Go to Jerusalem. Every city, the prophet said, bonds and imprisonment abide you. I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm ready to die for the name of the Lord. It doesn't matter to me. And he discovered that Everything that happened worked out to the furtherance of the gospel. The imprisonment, the lies, the shipwreck, the snake bite, didn't matter. He said, hey, everything's working together for good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. And even when people preach Christ out of envy and strife, it doesn't matter. Thank God Christ is being preached. Everything good is happening and that's because the apostle Paul obeyed. Jesus said, fill these six water pots with water. What does that have to do with anything? Just do it. <laughs> Remember Dave DeWelt was supposed to have preached a sermon 50 years ago in San Jose, 90% Catholic. 
He goes out on the street, had a big voice. You could hear him a block away. Come hear the only commandment the Virgin Mary ever gave. Of course, we say the Mary, the mother of Jesus, which is a more biblical way, you know, but he's appealing to a cat. Come hear the only commandment the Virgin Mary ever. Boy, you got a big crowd together, you know. Whatever Jesus says, do it. <laughs> Make the people sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Amen. What's that all about? Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Lord, I'm blind. Isn't there a more convenient way to get this mud off my face? You know, the, you know. He said, roll away the stone. Said, Lord, don't do that. He's been dead four days. And yet every time you obey Jesus, you never regret it. Now, we're talking about exalting Christ and the power of God and appropriating that power in our own lives, and you need to be guided by the Spirit, and you need to obey Amen. whether you understand it or not. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how's the will of God done in heaven? God says to Gabriel, and I want you to go down to Nazareth, and there's a virgin down there. I want you to talk to her. And Gabriel said, Well, that's a good idea. And one of these days, I'll be down around Nazareth and I'll take care of that for you, Lord. No, 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 no. Yes, sir. And it's very important for an angel to immediately obey because remember, Abraham had that knife. He's going to plunge it into his only son, Isaac. Angel said, no, no, no. There's a lamb, ram caught in a thicket. If that angel had been five minutes late, friend of mine, history would be different. Daniel's in the lion's den. God sent an angel to close up the mouths of the lion. If he had been five minutes late, it'd been different. And when God lays something on your heart to do it, do it. Amen. First time word worship is mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 22, God said to Abraham, you take your son, your only son whom you love, one of the mountains of Moriah, and offer him as a burnt offering. Abraham got up early in the morning, three-day journey. If he had a dilly-dallied around, maybe that ram would have been eaten by a lion or a wild animal, wouldn't have been there. When God tells you to do something, say, here's water. <laughs> what hindered me to be by God? It's what the Lord said to do, and I'm going to do it. I, you know, whatever Jesus says to do, do it. Principle number three, the principle of humility. In the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, Jesus pronounced seven woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody else say this, but I believe there was a Jewish mafia. I really do. Wherever there is a lot of money, there is organized crime. Is that true or not? Uh, and there was a lot of money in the temple, and Jesus said it was a den of thieves. Now, a den is a place where you're safe. If you're a lion, you get to the lion's den, you're safe. You, you're watching one another's back. If you're a wolf and you get to the wolf's den, you're safe. If you're a robber and you get to the robber's den, they got a cave down there in eastern Oklahoma, a robber's roost or the state park and everything. And you get over in Arkansas and hanging Judge Parker is liable to hang you from a tree or something, you know. But you get to the robber's roost and you got a den of thieves. You, you're watching one another. You're safe there. So here were the scribes and Pharisees and man, when they got to the temple, they were in control. They just had everything going their way. They even had the governor in their hip pocket. Remember Matthew 28, the soldier said, hey, the angel came to me. And I said, don't tell anybody that. You tell him his disciples came and stole his body. And if word gets to the governor, don't worry. We got him paid off. And then here comes this carpenter. <laughs> he marches in there and starts turning over the tables and the money changers and driving the animals out. And man, they, he was a dead man from that moment. 
I mean, you can go visit Columbia and you might be safe, but if you go down there with a deliberate attack on the drug cartels in Columbia, South America, you're a marked man for death. And for three years, they followed him up to Galilee and had a council how they might destroy him. He came down second Passover and uh, he healed a man on the Sabbath day and told him to, to uh, take up his bed and walk and they, uh, they, they, they sought them more to kill him, not only because he had profaned the Sabbath, but because he said that God was his father making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to these guys, who had always done everything themselves. Whoever exalts himself is going to be abased. Take it to the bank. I don't care how much money you got. Remember the rich man, he had a lot of money, a lot of contacts, and he was in hell, Hades, lifting up his eye in torment. So Jesus says to these professional crooks who devoured widows' houses and for a pretense made long prayer. I mean, they were rich, powerful men. He said, I want to tell you something. You go around exalting yourself. You're making a big mistake, buddy. You humble yourself. That's what Jesus did. Seven steps of humility, seven steps of exaltation. You better, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be abased. Luke 18, similar story. Two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, one a publican. The Pharisee said, Lord, I'm thankful I'm not like him. I fast twice a week. I pay tithe. I'm, I'm a good guy. And this other guy, he humbled himself. He wouldn't lift up his eye. He smote his breath. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, that's the guy that was justified because whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be abased. Luke 14 is the third time this teaching is given. You go to a wedding and you sit in the front row and Somebody more honorable than you may come and you'll be embarrassed. The ruler of the feast said, get, get back. What are you doing up here in this place? You don't belong here. Get on back there. He said, it's far better to sit in the back and get a tap on the shoulder. Friend, move up higher because whoever exalts himself will be abased and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. And as you plan your life and think about what, you, you, you better wait for the Lord Amen. to exalt you rather than tooting your own horn and trying to, you know, we were talking down there at breakfast about Herod. He delivered a great sermon. and People said, it's the voice of a God and not a man. Yeah, uh oh <laughs> Herod, you better think this over, buddy, before you take the glory which belongs to God. So that's principle number three. Principle number four is the principle of death. I alluded to it earlier. Jesus, on the way to the cross, John chapter 12 said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. New International says it remains a single seed or you get many seeds, you know, sometimes 30, 60, or 100 fold. Someone said that the postponement of pleasure is the key to civilization. I was down in the jungle of Ecuador 10 or 15 years ago with the Baurani people. They're Stone Age people. They don't have a way of saving anything. They live in thatched roof huts. So Steve Saint, who can, his dad died as a martyr down there. And anyhow, these men are now Christians, but they're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. They were in Shalmera and he gave them money and said, I want you to, we're going on a three day journey. I want you to get food for all the journey. So getting ready to make, get started out on the journey. He said, where's the food? And they said, we ate it. What do you mean you ate it? We ate it. They don't have any kind. I mean, seriously, if they killed a monkey or something and they ate half of it and left the other half in the jungle clearing, it's gone, friend. The only way they knew it is to consume it. So you give them a handful of corn and we'll eat it. But civilized people like the pilgrims, they plant it. There's a lesson here young men and women. The key to civilization is a postponement of pleasure. And if you love this girl, you're going to wait till you get married. If you don't, you're reducing yourself to a Stone Age culture. The key to civilization is the postponement of pleasure. And 
when we become a Christian, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You're dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen. Do you understand Amen. that principle? There's a time to fight like Jonathan and his armor bearer, and there's a time to be still. And that, in the 46th Psalm, man, the earth shaking, the mountains are falling into the sea, the sea is roaring. Be still! <laughs> and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And there is a principle here that you can try to be righteous and you can try, you can try, and you can try, and you can try, and ultimately you need to come to the place where you say, Lord, I cannot do it on my own. Amen. And when that happens and you really surrender to Christ, you tap into a power source that you Amen. cannot imagine how wonderful it is. Amen. Amen. Jesus died once, Hebrews 9. He carried his cross once. We take up our cross daily. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Whoever believes on me, as the scripture said, out of his inward being, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit hadn't been yet given. Christ had not yet been glorified. But you and I can tap into that power, a power that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, but it comes after we die and are buried with him by baptism into death. Principle number five. The mind, let this mind be in you. That's where the battlefield is. Adam and Eve didn't sin by accident. Cain didn't kill Abel by accident. The people in Noah's day were not sinners by accident. Every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil. The way you think is the way you live. No wonder they lived terrible lives that they had terrible thoughts. Achan didn't steal the wedge of gold and the Babylonian garbage. David didn't commit adultery by accident. Paul said, I want you to walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from God through the ignorance that is in them. We're talking about the mind, your mind. When they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, weren't thankful. They became vain in their imagination. Foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, made into a likeness of four-footed beast, corruptible man, and creeping thing. God gave them over to do those things which are not convenient. He gave them a reprobate mind. The way you think is the way you are, Proverbs 23, 7. So to be converted, you have to have a renewed mind. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. The word repentance in the Greek language is metanoieo, to change the mind. Now, we're talking about the power of God and being exalted and letting Christ exalt us. There's a sense in which do not really exalt Christ. We magnify him, Philippians 1.20, but magnifying doesn't change Jesus. You know, I put on my glasses and the page looks bigger, but it isn't. <laughs> it's the same size. It just looks bigger. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But our lives can magnify him or make him smaller. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wonderful passion and purity. So uh, we're talking about now your mind and setting your mind on things above and not on things of earth. One simple thing, uh, we had this story in the news several years ago, Sully Sullenberger, who uh, landed that airplane in the Hudson River and did not lose one person. That wasn't an accident. I mean, the engines quit and may have been accidental, but uh, Sully Sullenberger had been practicing his entire life for that moment. He was prepared, and that's the 
That's the secret to success in almost anything you do. So Jesus knew he was facing a great temptation. With strong crying and tears, he was lifting up his voice to God to save him from death. Let, I don't want to drink this cup. I want to do your will. So he's battling his mind. He's out there sweating blood. Angel came and ministered to him, and the disciples were sleeping. So when the guards came or the soldiers came, Jesus was mentally prepared. Sleep on now and take your rest. It's over. I got my mind made up. Soldiers... Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus. I'm he. Man, they, they started getting out of there. You know, maybe they remember that story of Elijah. These guys come to arrest him, and the fire comes down from heaven, burns them up. <laughs> they may have, I don't know whether they knew that story or not, but anyhow, the first ones are getting out of there, and the next ones couldn't, and they fell backwards upon themselves. The disciples were not ready. They all forsook him and fled. Jesus was ready mentally. And I don't want to be disrespectful of our Lord, but I think actually the biggest temptation he had was in Gethsemane, not in Pilate's judgment hall, not on Calvary. An angel didn't come to him on Calvary. An angel came to him in the garden while he was making up his mind. And anything you do for God not going to be done accidental. You're going to have to get in your Gethsemane and you're going to have to say, God, not my will, but thine be done. There's an old poem. I won't bore you with the whole thing, but it's kind of a cute thing. It was a dangerous cliff as they freely confessed, though to walk near its crest was so pleasant. And over its terrible edge, there had slipped a duke and for many a peasant. So the people said something's going to have to be done, but their projects did not at all tally. Some said, let's build a fence around the top of the cliff. But others said, no, nope, put an ambulance down in the valley. For the cliff is all right if you're careful, they said, and the folks ever slip and are dropping. It isn't the slipping that hurts them so much. It's the shock down below when they're stopping. <laughs> so day after day, as the mishaps occurred, quick forth with the rescuer Sally to pick up the victims who fell from the cliff with their ambulance down in the valley. Well, you get the point. That it's far better to let Jesus Christ rule your mind. To have the mind of Christ far better than it is to let the devil poison your mind and then try and pick up the wreckage down in the valley. Amen. Principle number six, principle of faith. Now, it almost sounds disrespectful to say that Jesus had faith, but I, I, I don't know how else to say it. Faith is the confidence that what God has promised, he's able also to perform. So Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down on the right hand of the majesty in the heaven. Where did he get that joy? He knew that what God promised, he was going to perform. He made a conscious decision. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to let him put me on the cross. I'm going to let him spit on me. I don't have to do that. I could call 12 legions of angels, but if I did, I'd be only one single seed. But if I allow them to kill me, God's going to exalt me. God's going to raise me up. And I want you to have that kind of faith. Gene Weiss told me this little joke about the little league ball player. He's grinning ear to ear and passerby says, hey kid, what's the score? He says, 78 to nothing. He said, I bet you're ahead. You're so happy. He said, no, sir, we're behind. Well, what are you so happy about? He says, we're just coming up to our first bats. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> Something good's going to happen, you know. And uh, it's so neat, you know. You give up the tricycle if you know you got a bicycle waiting. You give up the bicycle if you know you got a motor scooter waiting. You give up the motor scooter and you're happy if you know you got a car waiting on you. And Abraham gave up Ur of Chaldea because he was searching for a city whose builder and maker was God. Something better is down the road for me. I don't mind leaving it behind. I suffer joyfully the spoiling of my goods because I got a better inheritance, a house not made with hands. 
eternal in the heavens. And if you, my brothers and sisters, want to tap into the power of God, the faith principle is for you. You must believe. You know, this is not an option. You must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The seventh and final principle that I'm going to mention is the principle of the new birth. When you were born the first time, the sperm of your father and the egg of your mother united. 23 chromosomes from daddy, 23 from mama, 15,000 genes from daddy, 15,000 genes from mama. And that DNA of your daddy was there and that's who you are. Everything about you was determined on day one of your conception. The color of your eyes, hair, shape of your face, color of your skin, it's all, it was all there in the DNA code. You know, first time life is mentioned is in Genesis 1:11. On the third day, God created living things. Everything had a seed, and every seed had its reproduced after its own kind. Tomato seed and a redwood seed are about the same size, but they have a different result. Uh, the tomato plant grows three feet tall. The redwood tree grows 300 feet tall. And it's all in the genetic coding of the seed. So you have Adam's seed because you had a physical seed planted in a physical womb of your mother. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? And the second time, no, Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit, spirit. Don't marvel that I say you've got to have, uh, be born again. The only way you can ever get spiritual life is from a spiritual seed. And not rocket science. That's just simple stuff. So we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, even the word of God that lives and abides forever. So as we have born the image of the earthly, we can also bear the image of the heavenly. And when you're truly born again, when the seed of, you know, we don't sin because his seed abides in us. And there's a sense, Romans 8, 29, that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son because we've got his seed. I look, you know, I was born weighed seven pounds, you know, bald-headed, no teeth, bow-legged, pot belly. Say, so looks just like his father. <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> a little bit, but the older I get, the more I really do. You take a picture of my father at my age, and we look quite a lot alike, a lot more than I did when I was just born. So when you're born of the Spirit, you're an infant. You lay aside all malice and guile and envy and evil speaking like a newborn babe. You desire the sincere milk of the word if you may, that you may grow thereby. And as you continually take in of this spiritual nourishment, you become more and more and more like Jesus with ever increasing glory. Second Corinthians 3.18. There it is. We all with unveiled face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And we're being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another, and this happens to us by the Holy Spirit. Many of you knew about the late W. Carl Ketcher's side in his biography, autobiography, The uh, Pilgrimage of Joy. He talks about the knock at the door. He had baptized thousands of people into Christ, 43 years old, Belfast, North Ireland, and he said, on the final night of a gospel meeting, I always used the letter to the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and see he with me. And he said, that was my final message to invite alien sinners to the cross. He said, but in Ireland on that occasion, he said, it dawned on me that message was not for alien sinners. It was for lukewarm church members. And I, he went to a little meeting house on Berlin Street, six inches of snow on the ground. And it's a, you know, I recommend you, you read that. He said, I had never actually invited Jesus into my heart. I had accepted his, in, his invitation, but I'd never given him one from me. And after sitting there for an hour in an unheated building with the cold trying to get into every fiber of his clothing, he did what he should have done many years before. 
He said, I knelt down and I said, Lord Jesus, enter my heart. I opened the door. And Carl's testimony, he had ne never was the same. That was a turning point. And it can be a turning point in your life. As you think about, you know, Seth Wilson said, you cannot by your own will overcome your own will. And if you really, really, really want to have the mind of Christ, you say, Lord, I'm trying my best, but I can't do it on my own. I'm receiving you. Come in and sup with me, and I'll sup with you. Amen. It was the biggest crowd that Dwight L. Moody had ever preached to Sunday night, October the 8th, 1871. His text was, What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Moody completed, completed that sermon by saying, you come back here next week and I'm going to ask you to make a decision. What are you going to do with him? That was October the 8th, 1871. That night was the night the great Chicago fire began. It burned 17,450 buildings, 90,000 homes, spread to the forests of Michigan, took over a thousand lives, was not extinguished until October the 14th, six days later. 22 years later, the World's Columbian Exposition opened in Chicago, May the 1st, 1893. Grover Cleveland presided over the opening ceremonies. There were 27.5 million people that attended that exposition. Moody assembled another crowd as big as the one 22 years before. Hundreds of people were turned away. The service began at 10 in the morning, didn't conclude until 2.30 in the afternoon. He told them about the sermon 22 years before and he said it was the greatest mistake of my ministry. I've often been criticized and people have said, Moody, you seem to try to get people to decide all at once. Why don't you give them time to consider? I've asked God many times to forgive me for telling people that night to take a week and think it over. If he spares my life, I will never do it again. So brothers and sisters, God wants to exalt you. He really does. He wants you to sit with Christ in heavenly places. He wants to give you a new name. He wants to make you a joint heir with his blessed son, Jesus Christ. But he will not do it without your consent. Make that decision today. God bless you.